Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you're new here. I hope you're all doing so well. Welcome back to another true crime and makeup video. Today we are covering the case of Ed Gein, also known as the Plainfield Butcher. This is the craziest case ever and I think it will be one that will stick with you. It's one of those ones I heard and never forgot. So when this was requested via email I was so excited to get on and cover it. As always if you have any case suggestions then please leave them in the comments down below or you can send to my email which will be up on the screen now for you. If you want the details of any products used on my face they are also listed down below for you too along with my social media handles if you want to give me a follow over there but the most important thing is that you subscribe to me here on YouTube maybe put the notification bell on if you don't want to miss when I upload that would be nice if you've got any family and friends who enjoy true crime and makeup send them my way I will take them in with open arms I always think this case of Ed Gain is so interesting if you're someone that's into horror films like some of the classics are based off of Ed Gain so we've got Psycho from 1960 based in Ed Gain The Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 1974 based on Ed Gein, which I think that one's really obvious, like Leatherface. I'm not going to spoil anything, but yeah, very obvious. Also, Silence of the Lambs, that has elements of Ed Gein based through it as well, which is crazy. Also, if you've not watched those films, go watch them. They're amazing. They're classics. Love. But I think I've rambled and said everything that I need to say as far as I'm aware. So without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into the crazy case of Ed Gein. So, Ed Gein, or to give him his full name, Edward Theodore Gein, was born in La Crosse, Wisconsin in 1906. 27th of August, to be exact. But 1906, like, that seems like such a long time ago, and I just completely forgot how long ago this case was. So Ed was the second of two sons. He had an older brother called Henry Gein and they were born to George Philip Gein and Augusta Gein. Now, Augusta, we're going to get into her because that lady? Mm, screw loose. So Augusta was an extremely, extremely, extremely religious woman and I believe she was Lutheran, which I'll put up a description of what that is. I looked it up, but honestly, it's too much for me to remember. So it's here. She had a lot of power over her sons, predominantly Ed. She would preach about the innate immorality that was in the world. She used to talk about alcohol and say that it was the devil. She also hated all women. Don't know if she hated herself, but she hated all women apparently. She would say that all women were instruments of the devil and that they were all naturally promiscuous. And I'm like, Augusta, babe, do you mean you too? Are you, are you trying to tell us something? So, Augusta, she was always making sure that she was booking in some quality bonding time with her boys. So every afternoon they would get together and she would read from the Bible. Her favourite Bible verses to quote on these bonding afternoons were Bible verses from the Book of Revelation and also the Old Testament. And these would all concern murder, death and divine retribution, which if you're not familiar with what this is, because I wasn't, but maybe that's just me, it's basically supernatural punishment of either like a person, a group of people, everyone by a deity in response to some actions. So Augusta was very abusive towards her children, I would say especially mentally, but this did not phase Ed Gein. Like he loved his mum. He idolised and worshipped his mum and he actually became very, very obsessed with her. It's also worth mentioning that Augusta hated 
her husband, actually no, didn't even hate, despised her husband. He was an alcoholic, he struggled to keep doing a job. He did have like various jobs at certain points as like a carpenter, a tanner and an insurance salesman. And during his time in lacrosse, Gaden's father did own a grocery store. I don't know how successful this was but that doesn't really matter because he sold it anyway. And he decided that he wanted to go and live in isolation with his family which a Augusta was like, yes, yes, George, that is what I'm talking about. I want to go live in isolation. She never wanted to live in a town because she was really worried that people of the town, children of the town would corrupt both of her sons. She wanted them only to believe what she believed and only to act how she wanted them to act. So the family had made the move to a 155 acre farm in Plainfield, Wisconsin. Honestly, like... It looked like it could have been a nice place if he didn't know what happened. But like I was saying, Augusta loved this and she would actually go out of her way to turn away any outsiders who tried to come visit or tried to, you know, kind of like make friends with the family. She was like, uh-uh, mm -mm, not with my boys. So Ed would only ever leave the farm when he had to go to school and during his time at school, his classmates did say that he never really made any like meaningful connections and to be honest, he never really tried. And I suppose that's maybe like Augusta being in his ear, you know, kind of saying like, you can go to school but you're not making any friends, not with those little townies, they'll corrupt you. But his classmates did say he was extremely socially awkward, just kept to himself and he would burst out in like random fits of laughter, which is honestly the scariest thing. Like to witness that, sir please, like let's calm. And to make things even worse for Ed, who was already like a social outcast, he had a lazy eye and also a speech impediment and this did unfortunately make him a victim for bullies, like the perfect victim. And it just like things like that make me so sad, like things that can't be helped by people, like they're then picked up on and then they're bullied for it and it just, it's just yeah. horrible. And listen, I'm not like sympathising with Gein because we'll get there, but just it happens to everyone and it's horrible. On the 1st of April of 1940, Ed Gein's father did sadly pass away and Basically, Ed, Augusta and Henry picked up odd jobs around the town. So now they're having to socialise with the townies. Ugh. But they would pick up odd jobs around the town to try and make their living expenses. Both Ed and Henry were considered extremely reliable and honest within the community. People really trusted them around this time. So they both worked as handymen and then Ed Gein was also a babysitter for the neighbours and he said that he actually really enjoyed this. Ed Gein felt like he could resonate and relate with the younger children so he had a lot of fun during this time. He really enjoyed the babysitting aspect of it. So over time, Henry... Ed's brother. He begins dating a divorced mum of two and he had really exciting plans. You know, he was planning on moving in with her, he really wanted to live with her, he was going to help raise her children. Augusta did not like this. She's like, what do you mean that she's divorced? What do you mean that she has two children? No. Now, Ed always supported what his mum said and Henry was actually very concerned about Ed's relationship with his mum and sort of how under his mum's thumb he was, like reasonably so. I mean, this guy is just like, loves his mum, you know? So in front of Ed, Henry would state some mean facts about Augusta that Ed Gein just did not like. No one could talk about his mum in a bad way. Like to him, his mum was the best woman on the planet and he would not have a bad word said about her. Not around time at least. Ed really did just view the world the way that his mum did and Henry never. He would often challenge Augusta and talk back to her and disagree with things that she was saying, which Ed would never, never. 1944 and Ed and Henry are sent out to clear some vegetation in the fields and this was usually done by burning it. So they set out one night to clear all the vegetation in the fields. Little did Henry know, only one brother was planned to make it back that night and it wasn't him. 
they're out clearing the vegetation, right? So they've got a really good fire going, just clearing it away, when suddenly the fire gets out of control, like starts spreading and it just gets to the point where they can't control it anymore. And it was so bad that the firefighters had to come on the scene. And what they did is they basically extinguished all the fire. And then Ed was like, oh my God, like where's Henry? Henry's just vanished. So they ended up that they all went out with flashlights, they were searching, and they found Henry face down in the marsh. And it was ruled eventually that his cause of death was asphyxiation. But the officer at the time who was sort of like working the case just brushed over that and said that it was obviously an accidental death. I don't think it was. I think it was Ed. Everyone else thinks it was Ed. Do you think it was Ed? Because I'm pretty sure it was Ed. So with Henry's death, now both George and Henry were no longer alive and living on the farm. So it was just Augusta and Ed. And to be honest, they seemed to really like it this way. They obviously just really enjoyed each other's company. Ed never challenged his mum, which she absolutely loved. She had Ed under her full control. But shortly after the death of Henry, Augusta did suffer from a paralysing stroke. So Ed would then go on to basically dedicate his life to looking after his mum and being there for her. So in 1945, Ed and Augusta are out for the day. They are going to meet this guy called Smith to buy some straw from him. So they rock up to whatever it is that Smith is or lives. And this is absolutely vile, but Smith was beating a dog outside of the house. And because he was doing this, a woman had ran out shouting and screaming, begging him to stop beating this dog. And Smith actually bet the dog to death. And Augusta was very upset at this whole thing that had just taken place. But when Ed spoke to her about it, she said that she wasn't upset at the fact that the dog had been beaten. She was upset that there was a woman who was not married to Smith putting her nose in his business. She said that this woman did not have a right to involve herself in any of Smith's business. And she also referred to the woman as Smith's harlot, which I think that's old talk for whore, but let me know, I'm not sure. Augusta had then went on to suffer from a second stroke and after the stroke, her health just went on the complete decline. She deteriorated rapidly and unfortunately, Augusta ended up passing away on the 29th of December 1945 at the age of 67. And it is said that Ed Gein was absolutely distraught, inconsolable, heartbroken, like his mum was his best friend and really his only friend and everything that he knew came from his mum, everything that he believed came from his mum and now she's been taken away from him. A biographer by the name of Shetler had actually said in a book that Gein had lost his only friend, his one true love and now he was absolutely alone in the world and that is 100% how Edgeen felt at this point. After Augusta's death, Edgeen did wind up turning the house into basically like a shrine for his mum. So he would board up all of the rooms that she used that was like predominantly hers. He would board them up so they remained in pristine condition. He ended up moving himself into like a dingy, tiny little bedroom that's just off from the kitchen. And although his mum's rooms had, you know, been left in immaculate condition, the whole other lot of the house just went to complete waste. Like, Gein was not looking after it. He didn't really care for it. His main priority was making sure that the shrine of his mum was perfect. So at this point, like, Gein's trying to continue with some work, but he's actually just really enjoying delving deep into his obsessions. Um, One of his obsessions would be... Um, Nazi medical experiments that they used to practice. He was very much into researching them and like what they would do. He would also read books on human anatomy. He loved doing that for some reason. I don't know. Maybe we'll find out. And he also consumed a lot of porn, which is really strange for a guy that never actually went out and attempted to get a girlfriend. Um, but you know, the, the porn was, you know, giving him what he needed. 
no judgment here just judging a wee bit and he also read horror novels which like i can get on board with that i read horror novels myself sometimes i'm a big horror buff so that to me is completely normal but then he starts to indulge in like these sick fantasies that he has and that that's not me also i'm not sure what in the 2016 is going on with the makeup but we're just gonna roll with it okay thank you so we're now moving on to the morning of november the 16th 1957 where 58 year old bernice warden she was the manager of the hardware store she ended up mysteriously disappearing. Now even though Bernice had disappeared, the truck of the hardware store mysteriously left through the back entrance around 9.30am. On this day in particular, the store had only seen like a handful of customers and it was said this could be due to it being like deer hunting season so most likely a lot of people were out hunting deer. So at 5pm that evening, Bernice Warden's son who is the deputy sheriff, Frank Warden, walks into the hardware store and notices that the cash register is wide open and then he also spots bloodstains on the floor. So Frank Warden informs the investigators that Ed Gein had been inside his mum's store the night before and then he was asked to return the next morning to pick up a gallon of antifreeze. So, of course immediately they're like right we need to speak to Ed Gein and then they notice that the last receipt that Bernice Warden had wrote out that morning was for a gallon of antifreeze for Ed Gein and then that very evening Ed Gein was arrested at West Plainfield grocery store I'm kind of glad that they took no prisoners they were like well they did take a prisoner but you know figure of speech they took no prisoners when they went straight in for their arrest with Ed Gein because usually that's something that we just don't hear of. It usually drags on and on and on. Then with Shara's at County Sheriff Department, they decided that they were going to go and search Ed Gein's farm and I don't think anything will prepare you or I, let alone the deputies who had to investigate this farm, for what they were going to find. So a sheriff's deputy walked in and found the body of Bernice Warden decapitated, hung upside down with a crossbar at her ankles and then ropes around her wrist and it said that she was dressed like a deer. I didn't know what this meant and I googled, I googled it. Don't do that or I mean do it if you're really curious right but it's basically a way that deer would be gutted. Um, this is what happened to Bernice which might be why they call him the Butcher of Plainfield. Now I get it. They also determined that poor Bernice had been shot with a 22 calibre rifle and they were able to deem that the mutilations that took place to her body had been performed after she had passed away. So I can only hope that her death was as painless as possible and I really hope that she didn't suffer too much because although this case is insane, we do need to remember that this happened to real people. Like... It's just awful to think about. So with the things that they found throughout the house, the list is so lengthy that I am actually going to read it out. I've got it all in my trusty notebook. So let's get started. So the findings throughout the house, whole human bones and fragments, a waste basket made out of human skin, human skin covering several chairs, skulls on his bed posts, female skulls with the top sawn off them, bowls made from human skulls, a corset made from a female torso skinned from shoulders to waist, leggings made from human skin. Leggings? Why is this, why is this man want a pair of leggings? Someone should have got this guy in fashion design school. Masks made from the skin of female heads, a woman, Mary Hogan's face mask in a paper bag, Mary Hogan's skull in a box, Bernice Warden's entire head was found in a burlap sack. Bernice Warden's heart was in a plastic bag in front of Gaines' potbelly stove. There was nine vulvas in a shoebox. A young girl's dress and the vulvas of two females, judged to be around 15 years old. A belt made from female nipples. Four noses. A pair of lips on a window shade drawstring, like for pulling 
what the blinds shut, I don't know. Um, a lampshade made from skin of a human face, fingernails from female fingers, a human nipple doorbell. So like a female's nipple was made in a doorbell. Like, how did he do this? Like, I don't know about you, but if I press my nipples, they don't go ding dong. You know, I just, I want to know how this was done. I don't want to make them, but I'm kind of intrigued. So the artifacts, as the police referred to them, they were photographed by the state crime lab and then they were decently disposed of. I don't know what that means. Like, did they shred them? Did they burn them? I'm going to guess that's the only way to decently dispose of these. You know, I, I don't think we're just going to throw them in a plastic bag and put them out to the recycling. Yeah. So when Gein was questioned about all of these artifacts and, you know, the bodies found, he had stated that between 1947 and 1952, he had made over 40 nocturnal visits to three local graveyards. And Gein's purpose of going to these graveyards was to exhume the bodies of people who had recently been buried. So I guess that so it wasn't you know, people who were decomposing right away because obviously he had some furniture that he wanted to make and I don't think you want to do that with decomposing flesh. So he wanted the fresh stuff, I think. So Gein did state that these nocturnal visits were done purely in a, a dazed state. Like he didn't know what was going on. This old chestnut, right? He didn't know what was going on. He just wound up in the graveyard one night. And he did say out of the 40 visits he conducted, on 30 of these occasions, he would come out of his day's state and left the graveyard in good order and went home empty-handed. Very good, sir. Very good. On the other occasions that Gein had been in the graveyard, he remained in his day's state and the aim was to dig up the bodies of middle-aged women who physically resembled his mother because he wanted to take body parts home and make some paraphernalia, you know? Now listen, I don't condone this behaviour by any way, shape or form, but like if Ed Gein was wanting someone who resembled his dead mother, why did they not just dig up his mum? I feel like I'm, a I'm asking the question that we're all thinking, people just don't want to say it, but like why did they not dig up his mum? Why these other women? I, I don't understand. Gein had admitted to stealing from nine graves, right? And he was willing to take the investigators to the locations. Alan Wilimowski, one of the investigators, actually participated in exhuming three of the test graves to see if they could rely on the information that Gein was providing. So when opening up these graves, they noticed that the caskets were inside wooden boxes and as they dug down, they could see that the caskets were only two feet under the ground. And it turns out that Ed Gein was actually robbing these graves when the burial hadn't finished, like the grave hadn't been finished yet, so it was easier to access. Now, the investigators were doubting if Gein could do this by himself, single-handedly in one night, like, could he really dig up a full grave and then steal the body or the body parts? Now, they actually found the graves exactly as Gein had described. So there was one casket that was completely empty. He had taken the whole body. And another one of the caskets contained Gein's crowbar that he used for opening up the graves. And then the final one had most of the body missing, but Gein did state that he had went back to return some rings and also some body parts that he didn't require for his project. Now, when speaking to the police, Gein also confirmed that he was in the middle of making one of his most important projects. He was making a woman's suit. This suit was made out of skin, female skin. And the reason that Gein was doing this is he said that he literally wanted to become his mother. He wanted to be able to crawl inside of her skin. Like, sir, you never done that when she was alive. Why are we doing it now? They also questioned Gein about any sexual acts that he might have performed on the bodies, but Gein absolutely denied having sex with any of the bodies. He stated that the bodies smelled too bad, but like, 
they smell too bad but you're decorating your house with them like why is that not bothering you you're literally sitting on like chairs that you covered with skin and your lamps made of skin and you've got nippled orbit like your house must reek during the state crime interrogation, Edgeen had admitted to shooting 51-year-old Mary Hogan, who was a tavern owner. That was a head that they had found in the house. And although he had admitted to shooting her and killing her, Gein later went on to deny any details of her death. Like, he was saying that he couldn't remember it. <sighs> like, give us a break. Just say it. yes, I did it. Now, a 16-year-old whose parents were actually friends with Ed Gein and who had went to the movies and basketball games with Gein had said that Ed Gein kept shrunken heads in his house and apparently this was from his cousin when he was in World War II. He was in the Philippines and he basically kept these heads and then gave them to Gein. These were determined to be human facial skin that had been peeled from the corpses. And Gein was actually using these as masks. Masks, I know, I know. Now, due to Detective Art Schley assaulting Gein during his confession by banging his head and his face up against a brick wall, his claims and confession were then deemed admissible. Schley had died of heart failure in 1968 at the age of 43 and his colleagues had said that he was completely traumatised by the horrors that Ed Gein had committed and he was also very fearful of having to testify in court about the fact that he assaulted him. So his friends and colleagues believed that this was ultimately what led to his death was the stress from all of this. Now, along with the murders of Hogan and Warden, Gein was also suspected in a number of different cases throughout Wisconsin. So in November of 1957, the Wisconsin police actually confronted Gein with a list of victims who had died between his mum's death and then the death of Warden and was basically trying to gauge and see if they could find out any information from Gein, whether it was his involvement or if he knew anything that had happened to him. Suspicions of this were obviously aroused further when they had found the remains of Mary Hogan. Now, a lie detector was used in exonerating Gein of any further murders and a psychiatrist concluded that Gein really would only target women that he believed looked physically like his mum. On November the 21st, 1957, Gein was arraigned on one count of first degree murder and this was in the Washara County Court and he had actually pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity and then he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was also found mentally incompetent and therefore unfit to stand trial as well, which like lucky escape for him, I suppose. Gein was then sent to Central State Hospital, which was for the criminally insane and I think he was basically there for treatment to then deem if he could later stand trial for the crimes that he's committed. He was at one point transferred to Mendota State Hospital as well. So in 1968, doctors did deem that Gein was now mentally stable enough to confer with counsel and also participate in his defence. Trial began on November the 7th, 1968, and it did only last one week. Gein had said to the testifying psychiatrist that he didn't know whether the murders that he committed against women were intentional or accidental. And he did actually say at one point as well that when he was in Bernice Warden's hardware store, he was actually like examining a gun and it went off and shot her accidentally, like it discharged itself and then shot her and then he was a bit like, what did I do? And then he went into that day's state and doesn't remember anything else after that funnily enough. Gein's trial was actually held without a jury and I'm not entirely sure why and Judge Golmar did find him guilty on November the 14th. Then a second trial dealt with Gein's insanity and for this he was ordered to go to Central State Hospital for the criminally insane where he would continue to reside. So Gein would go on to spend the rest of his life in hospital and then the judge had actually said that due to prohibitive costs Gein was only tried for one murder, although he did actually admit that he also killed Mary Hogan. I don't really understand that. I don't really get what prohibitive costs means and why it means he's only charged for one murder. But I mean, 
I guess at least we got them. But Gaines possessions were actually scheduled to be auctioned off in 1958. Now, there was a lot of rumours that was stating that Gaines House would become like a tourist attraction, like a place where the public could just come and view. And I guess the town really didn't want what he done sensationalised, considering they lost quite a few of their people and possibly more, who knows? Now, it's worth stating that Gaines items were meant to go up for auction on the 30th of March, 1958. Then on the early morning of March the 20th, like in the early hours of the morning, a fire goes up at the Gaines household. This fire completely destroys and takes down the house and it is suspected that it was arson, but it wasn't further investigated and was deemed almost like a freak accident. However, people do state that they believe it might have been Frank Warden, you know, the deputy sheriff, Bernice Warden's son, that just called off any investigation for it. And allegedly, he might have been the one to put it up in smoke. But again, that's alleged. Can't say for sure. No idea. Now, when Gein was informed of this, I expected him to absolutely freak out, like considering obviously he had made a bit of a shrine for his mum in that house, but he just shrugged and said, just as well. Okay, sir. But like, you know, you went to some lengths to protect that house and make it a shrine. You're not bothered. And Gaines Ford sedan that he used to transport the bodies from the graveyard to his home was sold for $760 to Carnival Sideshow Bunny Gibbons. And this Bunny Gibbons would go on to charge 25 cents admission to view the car. And then Gaines actually passed away in the Mendota Mental Health Institute and this was due to respiratory failure and secondary to lung cancer and he passed on July the 26th 1984 and he was aged 77 at this point. So I mean he actually did live quite a long life. I mean certainly longer than his poor victims who whose life he had stolen so that's annoying. Now, souvenir seekers actually chipped away at Ed Gein's gravestone and then it was eventually stolen in 2000 and then it was rediscovered near Seattle, Washington in 2001, but the police had taken this in to their storage. Ed Gein's grave is now unmarked but not unknown and he's actually buried between his mum, his dad and his brother. So that is the end of the case of Ed Gein. I really hope that I've done it some justice and that you walk away learning in something new or even just enjoyed listening to me whilst I don't make up and discuss this case. It's obviously a very heinous and horrific case and unfortunately you know there's two women confirmed to have lost their lives and then so many bodies of people's loved ones being exhumed illegally and used for Gaines own personal projects. I really do want to hear your thoughts, feelings and opinions down below on this case and also please leave any case suggestions or requests down below in the comments or you can send them to my email which I'll have up on the screen now for you. Funnily enough, this was actually requested via my email. I had actually done this before but I was not happy with it so I think I ended up just deleting it when I uploaded it. Yeah, I'm so happy that you're enjoying this series and this is purely what my YouTube channel is is dedicated to now is true crime and makeup so we're officially a true crime channel and I love it. If you're new if you've just found my channel please go and binge the other videos that I've put up they're all basically like short movies I've just uploaded a John Wayne Gacy video and that's at like an hour and 10 minutes long so if you're struggling for a movie maybe put on my video. All the details of the products I've used on my face will be listed in the description below as well. My social media handles will be linked down below for you if you would like to give me a follow over there but it would mean the world if you can just make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. Maybe put the notification bell on as well if you don't want to miss an upload but thank you so much for all your support. I will see you in a day or two for the next case but until then I'll see you later. Bye!